This is SciBite, episode 53. Hi everyone, you're listening to SciBite, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly science podcast. Episode 53 was recorded live on July 10th, 2012, and released a little after that. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, Heather. Hey there, Heather. Hey there, Chris. Hey, happy science to you. Happy science. What are we talking about today? Today we're going to take a look at the latest information on the Higgs boson, dinosaurs, smart headlights, old minerals, Carl Sagan, spacecraft updates, and as always, to take back into history and up in the sky this week. Fantastic. Yeah, this is going to be a big episode with uh, the uh, Higgs boson and uh, some of the other things to cover since uh, we had our last sidebite. We took last week off and we're back now and we have got a ton, a ton to get into this week. I'm really excited. When all that stuff started breaking, I couldn't wait to do the show. So let's jump right into the news. All right, what is our first story? The Higgs boson. Oh, absolutely. Yes, it is the big news, and there's a lot of headlines going about, Mm -hmm. but uh, Mm -hmm. it's not all. It's like 95% as awesome as they say it is. Okay, okay. So. Hmm, 95%. Okay, so where do we start? Well, uh, I believe we have a clip. You want to go ahead and play that real quick? You bet. In the region of 125 GV. Uh, they combine to give us a, an ex- a combined significance of five standard deviations. So yes. that's the announcement. Yes, and science cheers, and everyone else takes a little bit, reads a, a blog, and says, oh, okay. What's that mean? Yeah, and they got a big smile, and the, 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 the cameras roll, and uh, Mr. Uh, Higgs, right, this is his name, he, uh, he even starts to shed a tear, Mr. Boson, he I'm does. sure. Boson. Higgs. Higgs, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Boy, it's just, boy, listen to that. Those claps are still yeah. going. Yeah, well, there were three people that theorized that it was there. Peter Higgs, Francois Elgert, and Robert Brelt. And Peter Higgs and Francois Elgert, Englert, sorry, were there. Um, their colleague, uh, Robert Brelt, um, was not alive uh, any yeah. longer. But both of them were pretty much going, wow, we didn't think we would see this happen. Right, right. Yeah, we, we theorized it, but we never figured we'd live long enough to see it. Yeah, to see the the science catch up and be able to to detect these kind of things. It was uh, early in the morning, July fourth. There I was trying to stay up. Who who cared about fireworks or lack of fireworks because of fires? I am glued to all the news. Right. Watching watching it as they have their announcement. I watched the live stream. Yes. Uh, I, that's what yeah. I did. Yeah. Yeah, I was able to watch some of the live stream. And then I grew tired, mm. and I um, couldn't find any live stream on the television <laughs> of it at all. So I was watching uh, various Twitter feeds on my uh, Kindle. There you go. And that's that's kind of a more you because you, you can take that to bed. You can just lay down in bed and bring that with you. It's kind of more low key. Yeah. So I was trying to stay awake, and then like check it. I'm like, wait, okay. Try to fall asleep, <laughs> and I'm like, wait. <laughs> so. What it all boils down to is that, you know, the, so we've got the standard model mm-hmm. of physics, and that's how the universe works. It was a you know, theory about electromagnetic, weak, strong nuclear interactions, the action of subatomic particles. But this, it's like a big, long equation that sums up, you know, the universe works like this. Bam. Giant equation that scares a lot of people. But it has, like, a hundred parameters that we don't know. Mm. It's like X, Y, Z, X1, X2, a hundred of these that we don't know. So we kind of make predictions as to what those are Mm -hmm. and we just kind of plug them in. We're like, okay, we're pretty sure that this should be seven. So we're going to make it seven. (laughs) So there's a little bit more to the universe than be able to do it. Just that. So like... Say Newtonian physics, you know, it's, um, you know, you know, he, uh, you know, it explains the the planet rotations and it's a simpler view of, you know, math and physics that says, you know, the 
you throw a ball down and this is what happens. You have planets. Mm -hmm. But on the really small scale and the really large scale, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So then you have to go into more complicated versions. The, the standard model is kind of similar where its standard model by itself is good for a chunk of the universe. But once you get to these extremes, then you have to be a little bit more creative. You have to have a little bit more detail about what's going on. Hmm. So going into some of this and going into some of these subatomic particles are bosons. So Higgs boson isn't just a, a thing on its own. It's a specific type of boson. And these are, I mean, these things include, you know, all subatomic particles are pretty much fermions or bosons. Fermions are the type of things like electrons, protons, neutrons, that kind of thing. But other things that are more a little, a little more uh, outside the box mm -hmm. are these various types of bosons. And what actually is interesting once you get into it is it's not just the Higgs bosons that are, you know, everyone says that that's the whole idea of what gives things mass. Because all these subatomic particles, they're whizzing around the universe at the speed of light. You know, the beginning of the, beginning after the Big Bang. Now, something had to give things mass in order for them to slow down, to coalesce, to make up atoms, to make up molecules, to make up peoples and internets and computers so that you can listen to science shows. Those type of things. Right. But there's... <laughs> And so it's like like a giant math computer in the middle. And you stick in molecules in one side and out pops, you know, mass and things like that. But it's about how you get there. And so there has to be a reason that these subatomic particles have mass. Right. As this is where we get a Higgs field. And it's a sort of field that's throughout the universe. And these Higgs bosons are actually um, like little pieces that pop up. Like say, um, you know, we're in a giant ocean, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what slows down. And when we're looking at it outside, what we're looking at is like the little droplets that come out. So we're seeing, you know, little evaporation or little drops and being like, aha, every once in a while that pops up and we're like, now we see something. And so that's the kind of thing we're looking for. That's what the Higgs bosons are. Nice. Is those excitations off of that so that we can actually see, hey, here's this type of thing now. The, the it excitations came from off of the field. Off of that field. So then we're going to, okay, okay something with this amount of power hmm. came from this location. And then so we can get a back track it from there. Hmm. And it wasn't just one observation that got this. Now, in the end, it boils down to they didn't name it the Higgs boson. What they said is, we're pretty sure that the Higgs boson has this weight, uh -huh. has this amount of energy. Uh -huh. And we saw something with that amount of energy, but until they get further analysis and are able to tell what right. that's doing, then they can't necessarily name it that. So it's not actually the discovery of the Higgs, it's, but it's yeah. the discovery of all signs point to we found the Higgs. Yeah, it's, that's a bird. What kind of bird? What exactly does it do? We're getting more details about that. Mm -hmm. we, know, we know it's this. It kind of matches everything up. But until we know what it's doing or what its parameters are, then we can call it a Higgs boson. What I didn't quite realize until the day was that there are actually two separate groups studying this. And it, you know, they were both going to present results uh -huh. on this morning uh -huh. about what their experiment said. They were not allowed to talk to each other until right before the presentations. Oh, no way. They were completely barred from speaking to one another because they were afraid that no matter what the result was for one of them, that it would skew what the other team thought or what they were looking at. So they weren't allowed to say anything. It was sort of a random draw who got to go first. It's like, okay, nobody... So they didn't even know if the other team had the same results? Not until right before the announcements. That's like they incredible. Were, they came out there and then they were allowed to know. That's yes, Could so, you imagine how they must have felt at that moment when they found out? 
Oh yeah. And then they're it's going a, out there to present the both of them. Could you imagine how ch- how charged up they must have been? At the beginning of the conference, like the first person to come up speaking, their voice is like, "Yes, and um, we we did this, and here's the." And they were, you could tell they were very amped up. Yeah. And it's it's obvious why. Wow. And there'd been some leaks beforehand that yeah, this is actually true, and there'd been a video that actually popped up beforehand of somebody at CERN going, yes, this is how it is, this is how it is. And then they came back and was like, no, we um actually got a couple different videos ready in case no matter what happened, we could oh, be prepared. Mm-hmm. And um, that that's what leaked. One of those leaked. Totally. Mm. Probably so. not, not, probably not a complete lie. No. They, I mean, they definitely had various, various answers just in case. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, some people... I'm assuming some people knew what both teams were going to bring to the table. And this has been amped up for a while now. I mean, the fact that there was going to be an announcement on July the 4th has been talked about for a month or more. Yeah. They're like, hey, there's going to be a big announcement uh-huh. on this date. I mean, they talked about, you know, this was going to be the year of, you know, to be or not to be. This is when they were going to find out, yes, we see something in that direction or no, we were totally wrong and lost in the woods. Now we're going somewhere else. So, and then they said, okay, July 4th, that's where we're going to announcement. That's when all, all the cards are on the table. And so it was kind of leading up to that so, so much that they kept saying, you know, we're analyzing every last bit of data to the last minute. And it seemed like some of the teams were like looking at every little bit of data right until the last moment they could. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure. I mean, I've had those those projects where it's one person's in writing the report, uh-huh. and I'm working on a, on the an, on a last bit you know last minute experiment, and they'd go through and they'd have like a positive paragraph and a negative paragraph, depending on how you know what happened at the next part of my mm-hmm. you know, my experiment. So I would come in and I give them the latest data, and they plug in the little bits that they needed to, and plug in the paragraph that they needed to. Wow, I bet I bet that's how so many things in politics and news work in general. Well, yeah, there's going to be you know various things like that, but for this, it was you know they kept saying we're we're taking every last minute you know bit of data. So I had the feeling that the way they said that is that everything seemed like yes, but they were like combing through every last bit of data so that right. they they didn't go out on the limb. Their names are on the else- line too. Oh, totally. Mm-hmm. T- the, their names, their teams, mm-hmm. you know, what affiliations they're with. Are they with, you know, universities? Future funding. Oh, it's like all, everything attributed to them or in connection with them. And if they've got it, uh, then all of those things that are risks are positive. Future funding opens up. I mean, all oh, of yes. these things. And, you know, tw- uh, you mentioned you were following this on Twitter. One of the things that I saw going around on Twitter was people uh, were like, this was really showing how now other nations are really pulling ahead in science. They're really standing on their own, making their own incredible scientific discoveries. And there really is just an incredible international community now that's doing this. Oh, incredibly so. Yeah. I mean, the uh, here in the U.S., we had, past tense, a, a super collider. It got um, shut down last year. You know, so they'd come out the Monday before this, uh, July 4th was a Wednesday here in the States. And on the Monday, they had an announcement that said, we gathered up all the data from all, I think it was 11 years that they'd been open. They said, we, all our data says this. And it was pretty much, we think it's in this, if it is there, it's in this energy range. And so then, so they put out that data and then, you know, two days later, CERN, both of their teams, uh, made their announcement and everyone for completely forgot that anyone else said anything. Oh, really? Well, I mean, they said something, but once you have, you know, people saying, two different teams of people say, we have a boson, the heaviest ever found, with this energy right there. You know, it's 126 giga electron volts is what they said, which kind of essentially equates to about 125 times the mass of a proton. But like I said, neither one of them necessarily said Higgs boson. And what the in the quote, you know, right before everyone broke out in applause, he says, you know, both of these two combat together gave it a, a 
a five sigma result, which is in order to say something is real in science, you have to make sure that you have enough data to exclude background noise and you have to repeat it enough times uh, yeah, that you know right, it's there. Right, right. And so five sigma means that it's about one in three and a half million chance that it's not real. And they wait to wait till then in order to say this. <laughs> one and a half. Say one it again. In, one in three and a half million. Wow. Yes. So they're, so they're feeling deviation. pretty confident they, about that. Yes. And it, I mean, it was both sets of data put together. So, you know, this team had this positive result. This team had a positive result. And then, you know, one of the guys in charge of everything went, all right. So you see here. You see here, and the whole time everyone's making announcements. They're all kind of got this, yeah, right. this elated smile and like the buzz in the room's all electric. And it was completely packed and there were people outside and there were live feeds to, you know, various nations in the world, you know, and everyone was, was waiting. And it's like, it's like, it's five, five Sigma data at 126. And everyone just like, is still for a moment and they stand up and they clap. And it's like, woo, Super Bowl for science. Yeah. <laughs> totally. This is like the super ultra, you know, Super yeah. Bowl for science. Yeah. Just sit in this. Wow. Now it's, it is not just that the Higgs boson doesn't explain everything. That is not like the one missing piece that we need. It really is not. We, if it exists, then Actually, once you follow the data, it says that the Higgs boson's mass would just skyrocket like by a trillion times. You know, if it, it works like this, hmm. then the weight of the Higgs boson just goes, explodes. So there's got to be something else to counteract that. So essentially, it's like we have this simple puzzle. You know, we have this little corner piece. You know, and if it's if the corner piece is a nice little, you know, right angle little corner to map the map our little our puzzle out then that's okay but what's better is if it's a corner of the the puzzle and then it has a whole bunch of other little squigglies opening up to like two or three other puzzles mm. so it makes it's actually better if it does that can then be like okay this is goes to here and then we can work from there i see so it's it's not a guarantee specifically and they're going to continue working through the end of the year okay. to get whatever data they can about these. Now that they have enough of the data to say they exist, now they can look at the actual particles and see how they act. And it's only through the end of the year because the start of 2013, they're actually getting an upgrade over at the Large Hadron Collider. Oh, really? Be, after the upgrade, they'll be able to detect even higher energy particles. That's funny. So, so they're like, all right, guys, well, we're not sure if we make it through 2012, we'll give you an upgrade. <laughs> well, I don't know if it was contingent upon the discovery of the Higgs boson, <laughs> but um. So and then, and then in 2013, they stop for a while. They go offline while they do the so, upgrade. Yeah, they'll go offline for a little bit. They'll do the upgrades, and then they'll come back online. I don't recall how long it'll take them to be offline. Um, it depends on how offline they have to go. Some parts of this are cooled to specific. Mm -hmm. You know, they have to be. Uh, warmed up very slowly, cooled down very slowly, and you have to wait till everything is is set in the um, the parameters that they need to in order to continue to run. So they are running; they're continuing to run right now. They're going to continue to get data right through the end of the year, and then they'll have to kind of bring everything to a sleep mode. I don't, I don't know how much or you know completely off or how far down they need to, you know, crank down. The, the engines essentially to replace or upgrade whatever it is they need to do mm -hmm. to get these higher energy data sets. Wow. And then they'll come back and they'll be able to possibly be able to look at other particles because this is, this is a pretty big boson. This is kind of towards the edge of what they can really ah, get okay. with enough of, with okay. enough of a standard deviation to say yes to get this, you know, five sigma. I didn't realize. Like they're calling it. Yeah, this is towards the outlying edges of that. Mm -hmm. And then once they get the higher energies, then they'll be able to look at, you know, 
different particles or be able to more easily look at the properties of this specific particle. Mm. But, you know, watching all the like the big headlines and, you know, of course, the, the obvious one is Higgs boson discovered. And, you know, they're not actually calling it the Higgs boson. Right. But the fact that um, it's not the Higgs boson itself that gives everything, you know, that gives the subatomic particles mass. Those are just the excitations. Those are just the little cast-offs that we can actually see. You know, if you're in the ocean, you know, and you're a little fish that's lived its whole life in the ocean, you, it, it's water all around you. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you, there's no necessarily difference there for you. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of living in that and then having to have something happen so that you actually notice, you know, something different pops up. So you're like, hey, wait. There, there's something there. It has to be different enough and that you can actually tell, and that's what the Higgs boson is. It's this excitation off of this field that completely surrounds us. In order to see that, then you can assume what's going on. And these things only last for, for so short a time. Really, you're looking at the bits that it, um, it breaks down to. They decay into this photon pair. Um, and then there's, you know, Z bosons and other various com uh, combinations of particles that they decay into. So that's what you're actually looking at. Mm. You know, they don't, they're seeing these specific decays that have to subatomic, subatomic particles that go back and say, all right, if these, you know, split up, then they have to go back and they would take this amount of energy. And then that amount of energy falls into the line where we think this particle should go. So it lasts for so short a time, even at the incredibly fast rates that they're looking at these collisions, that we're really just looking at, you know, what they've broken down into. You remember I was talking about the, you know, the water droplet above the water, uh -huh. being able to see that. Uh -huh. Now, it's not so much the water droplet we see. We see, you know, two hydrogens and an oxygen. We're like, okay, we see those things. Those kind of combine back together to make this. So you're kind of backtracking it to be able to say this is a this would be a Higgs boson or this lies in the area that we think it should be. Right. If I'm seeing this, then something like this must have caused it. Yeah. So, so it's the field itself, the Higgs field, is what's you know doing all the the heavy lifting, and we're just kind of seeing these Higgs bosons to be, you know, that's what the leftovers that we see, what we're actually able to detect to go back to. There's a lot of backtracking in science. You see this and you're like, okay, we see these little subatomic particles. We can backtrack that to a particle with this kind of weight that we pretty sure needs to be, it kind of fits in the equation so that we backtrack that up to this Higgs field. So. Really I, incredible. These, these people are, these fields and these, these things these people are working with are something that's almost imperceivable for me. I just can't even really grasp it. Oh yeah, and well, so I can only imagine. And, and since, like you said, since we are inside of the field, mm -hmm. it's like their 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 whole view is skewed. Yeah, it's being able to detect something that's there. It's just kind of there. It is hard, you know. It's it's really hard to imagine to be able to detect something that allows particles to have mass. Yeah. It's like okay. We see these because they're not traveling at the speed of light and doing absolutely nothing because we have detectors that are in this field so that we can look at things that maybe have this field. It's, it's a crazy little circle. And I was like, I saw somebody on Twitter. Um, you know, I announced on my Twitter. I was like, oh my gosh, you're for your weight. Go to here. So... And I was like all excited and everything. So, and um, I think it was Bronwyn from the the IRC channel was mm -hmm. like, "Okay, I'm waiting for it." Somebody just walked in, and there was a whole lot of clapping. Yeah. I don't think we've made the announcement yet. <laughs> and what that, what I believe that was, is that was when. Um, uh, sorry, when they came, when the Peter Higgs and Francois Englert walked into the auditorium. Mm. So these are the people that theorized in the beginning. So it's like, you know, they come in and it's like, all right, you the guys, hopefully 
in just a little bit. Right. I was watching the entire time and they would announce something and I wasn't sure if that was it because it was very hard to follow. But, um, yeah. you know, the the other coverage at the same time was, was helpful to sort of put it all in perspective. Yeah, there was a lot of people that were more likely watching Twitter feeds and blogs and stuff because they were the kind of the, you know, translating mm. physics double talk mm-hmm. into, mm-hmm. you know, English or whatever language should you speak. Well, wow. Any other thoughts on that one? No, that was that was a big thing that uh, took over my last two weeks. And I yeah. was just a little excited about that. Yeah, you got some great links in the show notes this week for that. I yeah. mean, I love the video links in there. You've got videos that explain it. Uh, one of them is like two minutes long. I showed a couple of clips from it. Yep. And I, I, I it's been the best. I, I saw that uh, video before the show. I thought it was one of the best explanations I have yeah. seen yet. Yeah, there is a really good explanation about, you know, kind of breaking down what this all is. And it kind of, even watching that helped me get my mind back around, you know, focused and saying, all right, this is how it goes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good so, one to check. Yes. All right. Well, let's take a quick pause right here and mention if you're a fiend like me, then you probably haven't lost track of the fact that Star Trek The Next Generation Season 1 is coming out on Blu-ray in just two weeks, right? Yes. July 24th. Um, yes. I'm very excited about this. I already bought, they had a little sampler that you oh, could yeah. get, and I bought that, mm-hmm. and it was incredible. Uh, it was, and, and it was like seeing it. This sounds so corny. I can't believe I'm about to say this. It was like seeing it for the first time during the opening credits. I got goosebumps because the enterprise yeah. looked so awesome. It looks yeah. so awesome, Heather. Uh, so, uh, we will put a link in the show notes. Now it is the, it is the entire season one. It's $78. Uh, however, that yeah. is, uh, if you, that's the pre-order price. So that's 40% off with the pre-order. So you might want to yeah. get it now if you're going to get it. Link in the show notes. And if you grab that, that's a great one uh, to give credit to us too, too, because since it is a little bit higher dollar amount, uh, a little bit more, it gets kicked back to the network. And uh, it's kind of awesome that it's a Star Trek thing at the same time. Yes. That is sort of, that would be sort of amazing. So thanks to everyone who does that. You will find a link in the show notes. All right, Heather. Well, I believe right. that means it's time. For the news bite. Now I heard that uh, when uh, scientists aren't busy talking about the Higgs boson, that they yes. might be debating dinosaurs. Again. They might be. And maybe if those dinosaurs were warm-blooded. Yes, believe it or not. Ew. I don't know. So you know, everyone assumes you know it's been in our you know, textbooks and, you know, it's dinosaurs are cold-blooded and Mm -hmm. this is just how it is. Mm -hmm. Except now in Southern Germany, there was actually, um, well, on a side note, there was um, skeleton with some feathers, more uh, feathered uh, dinosaurs in there that are interesting. But with these warm-blooded, you know, dinosaur things come from is that in cold-blooded creatures, the bones show yearly cycles of growth. Hmm. You know, if you know, in lean times they're not doing much; they're slow. Thin sheets of new bone are laid down. In the fat months, when they can actually move around and it's warm, then you get larger sheets of of bone. And so, hmm. this kind of back and forth from the seasons gives you essentially like little lines like in the bone, like a tree, exactly. And so, these are in cold-blooded creature creatures. Um, so they see this and so that's what they go through and they age them and they go, okay, this is how it is. But kind of turns out they really didn't look at warm blooded creatures. So a new study actually analyzed bone slices, uh, from 115 different species of mammals. Okay. Some as thin of a strip, as thin as a strip of hair. And they showed these cyclical growth lines as well. The same type that's in dinosaurs, mm. and this has been the the ma- one of the major backers to say dinosaurs are cold blooded because their bones look like you know reptiles of this nature. They're all cold blooded. Oh, so they just made that connection. There, there was a there was a straight connection. It seemed very straightforward until this study came forward with you know all these warm blooded mammals that also showed this. So it doesn't necessarily say that they were warm blooded period, end of story. 
It just says you can't rule it out anymore. The basis that said they were cold-blooded may have been faulty. Yes, is that these cyclical bone growths huh. could be either one. It could be warm or cold-blooded. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they've been studying more and more dinosaurs, and there's more evidence that they actually had a high metabol uh, meta metabolism. Metabolic, <laughs> metabolism, metabolic rate, mm -hmm. a little out for fast growth, yeah. and these type of things, which are also indicative of warm-blooded creatures. Uh-huh. Oh, really? So... So we've been talking a lot about these feathered dinosaurs and there's like a lot of things changing. You know, we had these scaly, cold bodied creatures that were in our little textbooks, you know, and in our museums. And now a great deal of them were thinking, you know, the feathered one that I quickly mentioned at the beginning of this um, was from a completely different branch of dinosaurs than we've ever seen before. It was you know, a meat eating, you know, completely different from everything else we've seen. So it's like, more evidence that a great deal of the dinosaurs were feathered. Perhaps they were warm-blooded. So we're kind of reanalyzing. I mean, you, th oh. you know, it's, it's dinosaurs. And now we've made a, quite a few really big leaps recently. Yeah, going, I just think of some of the stories that you've covered here in this show just kind of recently. And it, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of misconceptions. Yes. And, you know, the... The find that they had for feathers about this this meeting dinosaur is the fossilized is so detailed and just so amazing that I mentioned a while back with a side bite, you know, they were able to detect what color the feather was mm -hmm. on something. Mm -hmm. But this this specific fossil is so well preserved that it stands out on its own so much that in order to find the color of the feather, you have to like knock a little bit off in order to analyze it, mm -hmm. they're not going to do that. They said, this is too unique a specimen. There is nothing we're going to do to this thing except eyeball it really, really carefully. It is incredible. I'm, we're in the enhanced feed version, I'm looking at uh, what looks like something that just got smushed or something. Yes. It's just, yeah, it looks, yeah. You sh yeah, check out the show notes. The, the pictures of this were amazing. There were some close-ups in some of the stories that just made me go, wow, that's sometimes they're almost too real and it just feels very visceral. Wow, you can even see color variations or something in the on the head there. Uh, and they, they note that it lights up differently under UV light. This is just really awesome. Yeah. Wow, so, look at the uh, like the feather, like little stems coming off the neck there. Yeah. And so like you know, there's these feathered meat eaters and everything could be warm-blooded. And it's just kind of interesting how something as simple as that it can do the right amount of studies and the right fossil that pops up. You know, just something random and weird or new or reanalyzing data and suddenly things are possibly tossed on their head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, weebles wobble, but they don't fall down. But sometimes they kind of lay on their side going, what? Oh, man. I mean, I think this show has changed almost some of my the major understandings I've ever had of dinosaurs uh, between the, the feathered stuff and, and this stuff. It's it's. Warm-blooded Heather? That's no, yes. no, no. I can't. No, that's our dinos might have been fuzzy, warm creatures. I can't understand. I not, fun not the oh, not no. the scaly, cold things that you thought. Now maybe they're huggable. You know, uh, well, not the ones that want to eat you. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think so. I was gonna say I don't. I don't. They think might so. like hugging you. They might be neat to look at. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it'd be scary to see them if they could fly. That would make them very scary, although it doesn't look like that one probably would. But uh. No, they, the dinosaurs that they're talking about have feathers. They're not flying. I mean, there's you know, emu and ostriches and things like that. They're, they're not about to fly. They have feathers. <laughs> right, right. But the, the dinosaurs aren't even like that feathered. They're kind of scraggly. Yeah. You know, baby bird that it's like kind of like well, kind of like us humans where we just have hair and weird spots now and we don't have like we don't have like monkey hair all over anymore we just have you know patches that's where they're at they're just they that's had patches no not like that oh. no you know like a baby bird yeah like i'm gonna go i'm sticking with my baby bird okay, here okay <laughs> you know and as it's growing up it has this weird development where it's like patchy feathers and it's kind of scruffy looking mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that that's more like what we're talking about here with the dinosaurs only really feathers. big and scary well, you know. Yeah. Some of them were small. Yeah. Small and scary. Small and scary. Okay. Yeah. Various sides, sizes, and scary. <laughs> well, and possibly warm-blooded. Should, uh, should we go to the next story? 
Let's go. All right. So smart headlights. This has me intrigued. What's this about? Yes. So great deal of us have driver's license. We drive, it rain, it snow, mm -hmm. and headlights bounce off on that precipitation mm -hmm. and make everything really bright. And sometimes it's not so helpful. Right, so, like the uh, the uh, the uh, the rain or the snow is awful when it's really dark out. I have a hard time with that. Yes, and so what a new team has done is they they've been able to co coordinate a little camera in with the headlight and say, okay, so they detect this little strip of rain, you know, at the top, and then they're able to sort of use that to extrapolate where each drop is going to go, and then they take. Um, this illumination uh, projector and a beam splitter to essentially knock out oh my the headlight right where the drop's going. And there's a video in the show notes in the enhanced audio version that, you know, it's before and after. You know, and they kind of, you know, made a whole bunch of calculations and they actually plugged it into real life. And the difference is amazing. I mean, there's a little strip at the top where this essentially, that's where they're analyzing the data. You know, oh, saying, okay. okay, yeah. So how would they do that in real life? Well, that's that's part of the thing is that they will they could still do it. It can run. Um, it's got a latency of about thirteen milliseconds, operating range about thirteen feet. Hmm. So they're kind of taking it a slow but steady. Right now, simulations say that they could make it for um, a heavy rainstorm with a vehicle going about uh, thirty kilometers an hour. And, oh, goodness, now I forgot to put in the miles per hour. But, you know, so the thing is pretty much there. This is really high, you know, latency. I mean, really low latency. But you'd still have a – there'd still be a significant visibility improvement at lower hertz. I mean, this like is – 20 miles per hour, I think, isn't it? Okay, yeah, I think so. But it's still well, interesting. I mean, this is a this is something that – it would be very nice to have. And it yeah. wouldn't have to be for cars either. You could do it, uh, for example, I was on a boat kind of recently, and if it was pouring right. down rain in the dark, this you have the same problem out on a boat. So, and yeah. that, you know, those are much more different speed sets there. Yeah, I mean, there's going to be various conditions that this obviously won't work. In pouring down rain at some parts of the country and some parts of the world get to know, you kind of get the feeling, I grew up in this kind of area where if you block out the light that's going to hit rain, there's going to be no light. Yeah, welcome to Seattle, spot. Heather. <laughs> yeah, there is not a spot in the air that doesn't have a raindrop. Yeah, isn't that true? You know, or a, or a snowflake. But there are specific conditions that this would be helpful for. You know, and maybe it won't work for specific fe speeds. But if it's raining you're, or snowing, you're gonna, you should be going a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. And, of course, there's people who come back and say, oh, this will mean we can drive faster and then kablammo. Well, things no, bad happen, but no, no. no. The whole idea is that this is just going to be a step forward. I mean, the team says this is, you know, three to four more years of development. Then you move on to commercialization. It's going to take a whole bunch of years. So this is, again, one of those things that, wow, cool, look at this. Hmm? It's going to be a little while before we actually get to plug it into our cars. Right. But it, it was just a really interesting story that I saw this and, like, you know, I saw the video. And then I was like, whoa. Look at that. You can very clearly say yeah. see raindrops and then once they block those out, you know, essentially just av making the light not hit that. Which is super slick the way they're doing oh. that. Oh, incredibly so. Yeah. I I uh I would love to I would love to see this as part of an overall suite of things. You know, you have this, you have mm -hmm. lane detection now, you have uh things yeah. like automatic park. I mean, you have some really awesome stuff coming to cars and the, the next the next you know, the next few generations of cars are going to have some amazing things in them. And I bet, you know, this is version one. They might yeah. be limited to, to 30 kph or whatever, or 30 miles per hour, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's that's version one. But you put a faster processor in there and maybe you can get that latency down. And Yeah. I mean, the, you know, they block out them all out. Well, maybe, you know, at twice the speed, you block half of them out. Mm -hmm. That's still doing pretty good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, oh, yeah, exactly. Any any you know decent chunk of these that you can sort of dim down would be incredibly helpful uh -huh. uh, somebody from the chat room asked does it block out bike reflectors you know or i can see where you're going there bike reflectors or you know somebody has you know this reflective vest on 
No, what this is doing is it's looking specifically at this top going, here's something falling. I detect a little drop falling in this direction. Therefore, I'm going to forward calculate where it should go. Now, if you have something going side to side or you know, something just sticking in one position, then you know it may block out a little bit of the light, but it's going to be blocking it down. So you're going to have all the other spots around it. So it's not going to be blocking out bikes or you know, reflective vests or anything like that. And I'm sure as they bring this forward into revision two, revision three, they're going to make sure that those kind of things don't happen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and no, no auto company is going to deploy something like that because they don't want to no. get sued. <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, there's that. And then there's like complete safety. Yeah. Complete safety measures. You know, you don't want something like that to happen. The whole idea is increasing safety. Word. Word. Well, why don't we talk about uh, bringing the solar system or bits of the solar system to us since we can't always go to it. Yes. So, meteorite fell back in 1969. And sometimes these things fall and then they're kind of put into storage or we're able to go back and analyze them a little bit better. You know, this specific one got scattered uh, over the skies of Mexico, thousands of pieces across the state of Chihuahua. And, you know, it was considered the largest of its type, you know, chondrite. Considered by Moni to be, you know, the best studied out there. And now they've actually looked in it and found a new mineral. Ooh. It's called panguite, I believe. I probably mispronounced that, but that's okay. Panguite. And it's not only a new mineral, but it's it's something like really unknown to science. Really? Yeah, it's as far as they're looking at it, it could be one of the first it seems like it could be one of the first solid objects that was formed in our solar system. No way. Dating back, you know, before the formation of the Earth, before the other planets. So this is one, you know, these, sometimes these things where it's like these really exotic minerals point back to really ancient times. I mean, back to the beginning of the solar system. What a treat to get our hands on something like that. Yeah, so it's, it's one of those things where you're like, whoa. And you, or, I mean, it's filmed in 1969. You know, so there are a lot of these asteroid uh, meteorites fell, you know, in past years, even new ones. We're able to go and, you know, oh, yeah. analyze them or go back to older ones and sort of reanalyze them. You know, or this one had, you know, thousands of pieces. The Earth's been so, getting smacked around by these things for, for eons. Yeah. And it's funny because we thought it was really rare. But once we had satellites looking at the Earth, then we were able to say... Hey, there's a circular spot. Mm -hmm. There's a circular spot. Now, I mean, with you know, we have weather, so things get weatherized. You know, there's perfectly round lakes or specific formations that say, "Huh." Kind of hint that there might be something there. It yeah, might, we, might be from an we impact. Got, we've got pummeled a little bit. Interesting, by by larger objects. So we're able to look back and, like I was saying, there's thousands of this, this piece of this specific meteorite. So you can go through, and you're not going to be able to study all thousand pieces. You know, or sometimes you're not able to find it until later. So it's all these different pieces, and some of them are in the hands of collectors, you know, and various things. So it's, as everything kind of comes together, you're able to analyze little bits here, little bits there. Mm -hmm. That's where something like this comes from, where you're like, whoa, kind of out of the blue, really ancient, completely new mineral, you know, probably dates back to the beginnings of the solar system. That's, that's incredible. And yeah. we're just sitting here all along. Yep. Just, just, just. Just chilling. Yeah. All right. Well, great. That that was. I tell you what. I I expected to get one story, and I got a completely different story in that one. That's awesome. So uh, awesome. Now this next one, I I am particularly interested in because I am a huge Carl Sagan fan, and so yep. uh, tell me what's going on with his personal archive. Well, just a quick little bit. We've heard uh, you know off and on about the Family Guy creator Seth MacFarlane. Mm -hmm. You know, looking to redo uh, Cosmos with um, you know Tyson the. Yep. You know, that astronomer. Mm -hmm. uh, he's look so he went and he bought Carl Sagan's personal archive for an undisclosed sum of money from his his widow, who kept all, all sorts of pace, uh, his pieces of paper preserved in storage. Now these aren't these are things going from childhood report cards to term papers to letters. Oh no, kidding! So all sorts of different stuff, and. You know, Seth MacFarlane was able to purchase the whole collection. Um, so he, he got a chance to look at some of the stuff. And then everything was donated to the Library of Congress. 
Oh, awesome. Like 798 boxes of stuff. I hadn't heard that. Is this recent? Uh, yeah, fairly recent in the last couple of weeks. Okay. And, it, you know, he bought the whole thing. Wow, good got guy. To, got to, good guy, Seth MacFarlane. Wow. Got to peruse some of it. You know, some of the Blubber Congress, Congress was able to kind of look at it. Huh. And it's going to take a little while for them to, you know, go through yeah. all of these. And it was, um, I said it was funny. I don't recall what he named it, but he had like a key term for all the crazy co- crackpot letters he got. And they all went into one box. You know, he had like a key term for it. He's like, oh, that kind of letter, bloop, that goes in that box. Oh, wow. Maybe it was just like a box he could reach into when he was looking for a good smile or something to, you know. Yeah. I don't know. That's funny. They're like, all right, let's go. Oh. Did they happen to call oh. it the crackpot box? I don't think it was a crackpot box. Oh, okay. It's in the, uh, it's in one of the stories about what they, what they named it. Oh, good. But, so... That's a good resource to have. I'm I'm really yeah. I'm really pleased to hear that. I I had not heard that they had donated that to Library of Congress. I'm 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 impressed by Seth MacFarlane for doing that. that yeah, I was, quite a bit. Yeah, I've been more and more surprised by some of the recent stuff he's been doing with the uh, Carl Sagan and Cosmos related stuff. Nobody suppose this flashing light just right here. Hmm. Well, let's I don't know. See. I don't. Yeah. Well, oh, oh no. Oh no. Oh. Nothing. Higgs mm-hmm. boson. Get it. No. Up. Oh, up. Oh, oh. There goes. Sci-fi computer was a little locked up there. Okay. So, uh, Sci-Fi Computer's been uh, restarted, and it tells me we have a spacecraft update. Yes. Uh, recent International Space Station crew returned to Earth on July 1st, so just in time to uh, chill out long enough ah, to get the nice. on announcement. Ah, nice. Yep. Expedition 31. Obviously, it's coming back down uh, via the Soyuz capsule, so they, you know, fell and smashed into the, uh, well safely landed into the steps of uh, Kazakhstan near uh, uh, some city that I'm not going to horribly mispronounce. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so boy. you can see one of the videos, and it's kind of funny because right before it lands, you can kind of see this little flash, and then, like, dust goes flying everywhere. And they kind of had to come back, and they're like, no, that was not an explosion. Okay. That was the last minute rockets trying to slow it down just a little mm, so they hit a little hard yeah hit a little hard oh after well, all that time you're in parachutes and uh you know when you come back i mean these people have had long time you know extended period of time in space mm-hmm. so they actually just kind of list sit there and then the ground crew kind of picks them up and puts them into the special kind of carry seats and then carry them carry them off into vehicles because they're not quite ready to walk around yet. Wow. They, they have to have some uh, reacclimation time and a little bit of physical therapy. Yeah. Almost physical therapy in order to kind of readjust wow. their muscles and bones to, to earth gravity. A little bit of a uh, sacrifice of their own body f- in order uh, to further science. And hang out in space. Yeah. I mean, I, honestly, I would do it yeah. too. Although, so, do you know? Do they have to? Uh, so, there's just there's just only just there's just only so much they can do if they're up there for that long, huh? I mean, I know they they have exercise regimes up there. Oh, strict exercise regimes. Um, you know, various various ways. You know, they they have bungee cords. You know, it's not just to, you know, some of these things that are holding them down are not just to hold them down to mm. it. It's so that you have resistance against. So it's you know it's put it's holding yourself up against. The gravity of the earth that in itself is you know using all these different muscles in all these different ways i see and so just kind of standing floating around the space station your muscles aren't having to do that but if you bungee cord yourself down to something i mean you're holding yourself still but your muscles are having to work against the the pressure of that of those bungee cords as so they're able to use these various pieces of equipment where maybe you're pushing you know your legs and your arms up you know your things are caught in a spring and you stand up, you know, and you stretch out this spring and it takes, you know, effort on your muscles. And there are all sorts of different, you know, mechanisms and, you know, specific ways to exercise in order to combat that as much as possible. But it's, it's still not going to be the same. Right. Right. Well, the the body, the body was designed with gravity in mind. Yeah. We're, we're pretty used to gravity. Yeah. 
Turns out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, should we talk about uh, this uh, fuselage story fi- where this fuselage found a new home, perhaps in my backyard? Yes, right in your backyard. The full fuselage trainer. It's a life-size shuttle mock-up. It was used by every person who flew on the shuttle while training at NASA Johnson Space Center. Ah. In Houston. I saw this thing. I've gotten to tour. There's a regular tour group that, you know, there's this whole building of these. You know, there's that, you know, large fuel, you know, full fuselage mock-up. There's, you know, the small nose cone that actually kind of is a trainer, you know, where it, it tilts this way and that way. Like, you know, you might see some some trainers in various malls where, you know, you get propped up and it tilts this way and that way. Yeah. So there's all these different types of trainers and, you know, f- mock-ups. And there's this huge room and the regular tour, kind of, there's this pathway, you know, that goes around the outside of the building. And every once in a while, like once in a year, once a year, or once every other year, they have like a special day where you're like, have more visceral feeling. And I was able to walk on the floor of that building. Ooh. And it's funny to think that none of those things are there anymore. Yeah. That that is in, you know, Seattle awesome for you. But I remember walking into that bay and just kind of, it was funny because there's all these people around me and I walk and I'm able to look at it. I'm just standing there in the middle of this crowd of people that are all kind of walking around me, you know, and one of the, you know, employees is off to the side, kind of snickering. And my mom's just kind of standing there waiting for me to, you know, breathe. <laughs> She's like tapping me on the shoulder, breathe dear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I will later. But it's, you know, it's 28 feet long compartment. It's got the nose cone, uh, both levels, because there's two levels. You know, the the flight deck, the mid deck. And it actually came in the super guppy. I've never seen anything like this. This thing is crazy. It was, it landed on uh, Saturday, June 30th. It is huge turbo turboprop aircraft. This thing delivered modules for the space station to Florida. And it's weird because you can see, you know, there's, you know, landing videos. I couldn't quite find one that where it was opening up, mm-hmm. but there's pictures and this plane really pops open sideways, like splits in two. Like, like a toy, like some child's toy. Yeah. And like the very tip front is like, you know, the the cockpit. And then this huge bubble of an aircraft that kind of splits open. You know, it's just like the nose just pops open on a hinge. That's kind of awesome, though. I got to be honest with you. That's and a great they, way to do it. They roll it out. And that's some, you didn't all get the whole thing at once. It's just the, the front, the nose cone section, ah. the compartment that's, that's delivered right now. You know, uh, you get the rest of the, uh, you know, the the bay and the tail and the wings, you'll get that later so this is going to be on display for ever here yeah it's going to live at the seattle museum of flight that is so cool for me it's going to live there you know other places you know got shuttles and so you did get something you got the the trainer so it was in space but every single astronaut that went to space trained on that thing wow well between this and we also have a cold war era russian submarine down in our harbor that you can tour. So, uh, boy, yeah. Seattle's becoming the destination for some things, I guess. It's got a shuttle mock-up. That's pretty cool. That yes. You know what? I wonder if they'd let me record podcasts from in there because I can make a really awesome set out of that. Oh, no kidding. You know? I mean, hmm. I, that would be something, you know, where, you know, I, I might force myself to wish, to, you know, film on location. Um, right. Oh yeah, maybe we could do like a maybe we could do like a one's very special for our for our two year anniversary. Maybe we could do it live, <laughs> from, live from the space shuttle. Live they should have the... it all assembled by then, right? Well, yeah. All right. What do you say we uh, jump in the time machine here? Let's go. Okay. Come on, close the door. All close right. the door. I, I it. Right, hold on, hold on. Here we go. I'm waiting. Oh, that wasn't too bad. Oh, oh. oh, okay. That only took us 18 years ago to uh, July 16th, 1994. Shoemaker Levy 9. Some of us may remember this comet is the one that smashed into Jupiter. Oh, yes. The first major fragments of that started hit uh, 21 different major pieces. And the first of those hit on July 16th. That makes me feel so old. Are you kidding me? I know. 
I mean, because, I, wow, I remember that pretty I clearly. Was, <laughs> oh, I, I completely remember this. You know, I, I may have been completely obsessed with science my entire life. So uh, specifically astronomy. Um, so I remember looking at this and waiting for the the pictures to come back. Yeah. And I like did a hand drawing of like the first image that I saw. I was like, had my colored pencils out. I dug them out and it was like drawing by hand what I, you know, what was coming back on the television. Yeah. And I remember you could actually see it through telescopes, through yeah. small telescopes. And we're taking mine, it was like an eight inch. So taking it out in the yard and like focusing it on Jupiter, you know, I had to wait for it to come around a little bit and you could see little dark marks on Jupiter. Mm-hmm. And I remember that. And it was, it was crazy because it gave, not only was it amazing just for so many reasons, but it allowed science to kind of take a peek into the interior of Jupiter. Right. Because these things pounded into it and then you it brought up a whole bunch of the, the interior gases. It essentially made it look like Jupiter had a whole bunch of black eyes. Yeah. But the only thing that scientists were kind of, the only tiny drawback was that they hit just behind the horizon that we could see. I do kind so of there being a disappointment about something. Yeah, there was just a little bit about that. We could, if you were looking at it, you could still see like the the plume of like the yeah the explosion come up from just behind it, yeah. and then we had to wait for it to come around, and so we could start seeing these happen. Yeah, the com- I mean, the comet had been caught in Jupiter's orbit. It just wasn't you know magically in twenty one pieces. It actually had swung by Jupiter two years earlier, and that broke it up into all the different pieces. Because mm-hmm. so then it came back, and then it smashed back in. Wow, that's a great little trip down memory lane. It's not too often that we jump in the time machine and we talk about something that happened squarely within my memory. Oh, so. yeah, like something that I very specifically remember. Yeah. And I remember like doing all these things about it, looking at it, talking about it, viewing it. Right. So it, right. it was definitely, you know, <laughs> one like of those it, things in my brain. I'm like, yeah. oh, awesome. That's right. And I, I share this with the entire world. I, 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 I seem to remember getting really low res images of it online. But is that possible in 94? I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. I remember I remember that was one of the one of the few things I got information from online and I my my grandpa was a huge astrolo- astro- astro- astronomy astronomy yes. fan and I was trying to convince him to get the internet because I was able to read things about it before he got his magazine. <laughs> 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 so yeah, there you go. There all you right. Go. All right, Heather, well let me retune the side by computer okay. so we can look up into the sky this week. That's right. This week about an hour before sunrise. We still get the beautiful view of Venus and Jupiter. They're still going to be the brightest things out there. Venus is the brighter of the two, but Jupiter is still on top because we are totally unbiased nope, view around nope, here. No, but Jupiter just, just is the best really in the cool. Solar system, not even seen yeah. better than Earth. That's all. Oh yeah, but you know it's it's the higher of the two. Now, just above and to the right of Venus, you're going to see something red. Hold yourself back from calling that Mars. It is actually a red giant star called Aldebaran. Oh uh, okay. So, not quite Mars, but you can show off your smarts by going, no, 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 that's not Mars. That is a red giant star. Because otherwise, and I'm glad you said something, because otherwise I totally would have thought it was Mars. So, Yeah, and uh, Jupiter and Venus, you kind of extend there in a, you know, extend that line about as far as you do. Um, there's the Pleiades star cluster. Be a little bit of a, a fuzzy spot for some of us or a tiny little grouping of stars. Okay. It all depends on your, uh, your sight and uh, your vision. Mm. And on Sunday, July the 15th, about an hour before sunrise, actually most of Europe and parts of Asia will get to see the moon pass in front of Jupiter. It's going to be called an occultation. There's links in the show notes to see the time and location. But that's when you know the moon will actually blank out Jupiter. It'll oh, Pass cool. right in front of it. So it'll, but only uh, parts of Europe and Asia get to see that. But yeah. anybody no in our... Uh, Nothing for no, us. No, no party for us, but... Any uh, listeners in that part of the world, you get to see it. You go ahead and uh, shoot us a line or oh yeah, tweet or whatever you can to let us know that you saw it. Yep. And what is your Twitter handle? It is JB underscore Mars underscore base. Yeah, absolutely, everybody. So if you have any uh, anything like that, any pictures or anything like that, that'd be really cool. Send them to Heather. Now, Heather, before we get out of here, uh, yes. we wanted to uh, pay, uh, pay special remembrance to somebody before we wrapped up. Uh, yes, uh, my uh, uncle-in-law. 
uh, passed away just a few hours ago, so I'd like to dedicate this to uh, Donald Duvall. Absolutely, and I'm, I'm sorry for your loss, so yeah. There you go. And Heather wanted to come on and continue to do the show. So thank you, Heather. It was a great show. There's a ton of really awesome stuff in this episode. Yes. So I'm glad we were able to do it. So, And thank you, everyone, for tuning into this week's episode of SciBite. Now, you can watch us live and chat all right along with us in the chat room as we're going. And you hear Heather answer people's questions over jblive.tv on Tuesdays at 7.30 p.m. Pacific. All right, Heather, we'll see you next week. All right, see ya. All right, everyone. See you back here next week. <laughs>